Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alice Roche. I'm the COO of Charity Digital. I'm going to be your host for today's session. So I just want to give everybody a really warm welcome. Whilst we're waiting for others, do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Let us know where you're coming from today. So firstly, while we probably have people coming through, I just want to say thank you for being here with us today and just a little bit about Charity Digital. So we are a registered UK charity and our mission is to help other charities to increase their uh, digital transformation and increase their impact by being more digital. We do this by two main activities. So that's educating the charity sector, um, running webinars and events and articles and uh, things like this to be an informed voice in the sector. We also provide access to software products that charities need at dramatically reduced and discounted prices. So we're really, really proud to say that we have helped over um, 1 million charity professionals learn about digital transformation and improve their digital skills through our content. And we have also helped over 77,000 charities save in excess of 284 million on their technology investments. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and I'm going to introduce our session now today. So today we're going to be talking about uh, digital finance and how charities can prepare for prosperity uh, by getting their technology right now. So I'm going to pass over to our two presenters. I'm going to hand over to Darren to introduce himself. Hello, Darren. Hi, Alice. Thanks for hosting us on this. It's great to be here. Um, just to, my, my role is uh, Chief Operating Officer at Accounts IQ. I, my background professionally, I'm qualified as a chartered accountant with KPMG. <clears throat> um, I've worked in, in industry um, as a, a head of finance um, and I've been with Accounts IQ for 12 years overseeing, <clears throat> ultimately overseeing over a thousand uh, implementations <clears throat> uh, in terms of digital transformation from, from various different finance systems. Um, and I'm very a firm believer, by the way, just in the nonprofit world, I, I've been involved in uh, on two school boards, still on a school board for over thirteen years. So uh, I, it's a it's um it's a always a privilege to be able to 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 give time to the nonprofit sector. So um yeah, that's uh, great to be here. Hello. I'm Janelle Bentley, responsible for finance and central services at um, Swansea Council for Voluntary Service. We're uh, recent new clients with uh, Accounts IQ and here to give some customer feedback. Thanks, Janelle. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you so much. So just yet yeah, a little overview of the session. Uh, the session will share details of how charities can enhance their decision making with detailed, transparent data. Uh, becoming more than just a problem solver. We're going to talk about uh, practical ways to improve automation within your organization, enabling both time and cost savings, and an introduction to AI and where it's emerging in finance functions. So I just want to go through some very quick house rules. So the session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to watch on demand within a week's time. The slides and other resources will be made available to you by the end of the day, so please don't worry if you've missed anything. Closed captions are also available for today's session. To enable these in the bottom of the Zoom window, um, click the up arrow and then you'll see closed caption and show subtitle. I believe my colleague has also put some instructions in the chat. During the webinar, please do feel free to use the Q&A box. Please pop all questions in there and we will address those at the end of the presentation. Please share any other comments, your experience or top tips in the chat section. And uh, if there is a particular question in the Q&A box that you like, you can also upvote that and we'll come to that question first. And finally, if you do encounter any sound or image issues, please let us know in the chat box and we will get our, you know, do our very best to get the session back up and running for you as soon as possible. And without further ado, I will pass over to Darren. Thanks, Alice. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, um, hopefully this, the start of this will be 
interesting. Hopefully, the whole thing will be interesting. But uh, look at I look at AI and uh, and what does it really mean? Um, it's a, it's a real buzzword at the moment. It's been around a long time. Ultimately, um, but uh, we're going to try, try and understand what it what what it really means. How practical is it, and the types of impact it might have on on finance functions and finance professionals. And then we're going to look at the importance of uh, having a finance function vision, um, reassessing the purpose of your finance function in the context of, <clears throat> of I guess today with the amount of technology we have, as well as um, as well as the amount of the importance of of communicating financial information to various different stakeholders, uh, particularly uh, as nonprofits have so many stakeholders. And then um, Janelle is very kindly joining us today. Um, so to put a real life example uh, to some of the problems and challenges that uh, <clears throat> that uh, SCVS faced and how they've kind of got through those and and what obstacles uh, stood in the way of a, of a transformation. Um, and then, so, which which is important, we have a Q and A session um, at the end. Uh, that because obviously every situation is unique. Um, a lot of the solutions at a high level uh, will work, but but everyone will have their own individual people and own individual challenges. So that's a, a chance for for us to get in conversation with those. Um, <clears throat> so AI. Uh, I'm sure that there is uh, a diverse range of understandings of AI. I'm sure there's lots of people that are curious about it. Uh, I'd be uh, really curious to know how many, uh, maybe you could put it into the chat, um, just to get a sense of, of how many people have actually used ChatGTP or have a, a ChatGTP account. Um, <clears throat> I use ChatGTP on my mobile phone and on my desktop. Uh, every single day, multiple times during the day at this stage. Uh, I'm amazed at just how useful it is. Uh, it's just a, a way to, to source uh, factual information to organize and, and help with planning. Um, so it, it's, it's got, had a real impact to my life already. Um, and it's actually been around us for a long time without us probably even realizing. Um, so what actually is AI? Um, it's effectively a computer making computer program capable of performing tasks um, that typically require the subtleties of uh, judgment and interpretation and generalization that we associate and link to, I guess, what we do as humans. Um, and it, it does require, uh, what's interesting is <clears throat> developing AI actually requires us to really understand the thing we're trying to do in the first place. So if you take uh, AI being applied in the domain, uh, narrow, domain narrow AI being applied, say, in, in the legal world, you obviously have to understand the way uh, lawyers are trained and the way lawyers make decisions, how they they ju make judgments, etc., based on the facts that, that are there for them. So, developing AI requires domain experts for narrow AI, for example. And there's some simple examples of AI. So, nest home heating uh, at, a, at a rudimentary level, almost like if you can think of a single cell amoeba, something really basic is a uh, is a thermostat on a wall. <clears throat> it it perceives data. Um, and it runs through a simple objective and makes a judgment call to adjust the temperature up or down uh, or stay the same based on uh, its objective being the, the, the temperature it's supposed to achieve. So effectively, you know, we've been using basic forms of rudimentary AI, uh, you know, perceiving data, making a judgment call based on an objective for, for a really long time. And then you, you come to the extreme end of, of, of things with AlphaGo. If you haven't seen the Netflix show, you should definitely have a look at it. It's effectively a Google built through using these neural networks, which is effectively advanced maths to work out uh, probabilities. Uh, I don't know exactly how it works. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, it, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, very fast way uh, to learn uh, against a set of objectives. And it makes calls and then learns from being right or wrong. So AlphaGo is a, is a game. Uh, Go is the game, and it's very, very. It's it's, it's even harder than chess. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to set a little bit of context as well. Um, so, uh, as as a species, uh, you know, this is kind of showing us through the different ages. We have language. Our our precision with language is is so power so powerful. Um, and we we can share it and store it in vast quantities and are able to pass it from generation to generation. And that's really what's seeing us in this connected intelligence age. 
Um, if you if anyone ever wants to, the source of this is a guy called Christian. Uh, it's a super TED talk, um, which which takes you all the way through uh, the evolution um, of the universe and, and back to just uh, how we're embracing um, digital intelligence in in our era. Um, and just to put a little bit of context, so we, we've obviously had different industrial revolutions, the steam, electricity, computing uh, in the last century. And in this century, it's dubbed the fourth industrial revolution and um, the intelligence revolution. And there's a number of fundamental factors that are that are giving us that uh, that capability, principally computing power and the vast amount of data I mean, you're effectively able to to access all the data in the world through through your hand through a mobile phone nowadays, and that's really something that's only happened uh, this uh, this century. And um, so again, we're <clears throat> we're we're in this intelligence connected uh, revolution. Uh, there is a huge amount of our our working lives, uh, how we communicate with each other, how we work. Uh, is being uh, is being changed hugely um, uh, through through this uh, uh, through this era through automation, um, artificial intelligence, and, and blockchain is another uh, technology, um, and this is providing a whole new wave of of interconnectedness uh, and peer to peer connections. So, how will this impact everybody? Um, so, through every industrial revolution there has effectively been uh, the the destruction of jobs or roles uh, there's been a, a typically an enhancement in, in productivity and then there has been the creation of jobs that we didn't even know existed um, and there's always fear around uh, around around periods of, of extreme change like this um, and uh, I guess it's 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 tried it's trying to understand it uh, and and in, in in the technology space, it's it's about trying to harness and use technology to augment uh, what our purpose is and what our role is. Uh, and I think finance teams and finance professionals <clears throat> have a huge opportunity because the the change in tech will absolutely uh, make certain tasks. Uh, that you do redundant, as in the computer computers will continue to take over more as they've been doing for decades. Um, but it's about it's about how do we augment and effectively do a whole lot more um, as a result of of, of this uh, change in tech. So machines effectively uh, will be augmenting our hands, <clears throat> uh, AI our heads, and uh, social our hearts. Uh, I think in the nonprofit world. Uh, if you look at predictions for AI, uh, the the empathy, caring uh, nature, that whole space, the social element um, is is deemed to not be replaced by AI, and the ability to care for for people um, and help people is, uh, is 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 something that will probably uh, have a big surge. So that's obviously very much in the nonprofit space. And in terms of varying roles of accountants and the finance team, so I mean, you all have your uh, your objectives and your and your your role in terms of what what you're doing, um, based on how you how you need to gather information, report it, uh, <clears throat> different forms of compliance and uh, sort reporting, different stakeholder reporting. But effectively, you know, another way of viewing the role of accountant is is custodians of data. Um, and, and becoming much more familiar with how to how to gather and capture data, how to uh, maintain it uh, accurately, um, and then ultimately how you communicate and share this information um, accurately understood um, in order to make sure people can make good informed decisions. And then naturally accountants need to apply judgment um, across financial reporting, compliance, decision making. Um, and using uh, your your you need to use your expert knowledge and your sound decisions um, to ensure that you're also um, adhering to accounting principles, regulations, uh, and also being able to tell the right stories to the right people. So it's a nice quote. Um, I, I'm making it a little bit of an assumption that some of you have already changed uh, a finance system. Uh, being involved in some kind of change project or uh, or are about to embark on it. I, I think this quote's lovely. Um, and you know, the, the measure of intelligence is more about your uh, your ability to to change and adapt to change. Um, and I think that uh, I think that as as a as a collective finance team or a collective organization, <clears throat> your ability to change and adapt new practices. 
um, it certainly creates a, 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 a great collective intelligence for any organization. And a lot of that's down to your ability to change. <clears throat> so in terms of different types of AI, there's this narrow AI. We talk, touched on that a little bit before with like a legal profession and there's what's known as generalized AI. We don't have generalized AI yet. Um, there is different predictions uh, of when generalized AI may come about. Uh, 2040 uh, is sort of the earlier predict uh, time frame, where ultimately that that's the, the the time when we'll we'll deem to have sort of uh, gone beyond human part, human uh, like intelligence. <clears throat> so once we kind of get to that point, it, it's likely to kind of go beyond it. And ChatGTP, um, they're you know they're, they're they're talking about breakthroughs around generalized AI. We, we're not really too sure whether that's happened yet. But narrow AI is, is really where you're going to find uh, the augmenting AI into, into, your, into your role as a finance professional. Uh, and really it's up to, it's up to technology providers uh, like us uh, and like others uh, to ultimately basically understand what, what's, what your jobs are, what your problems are as finance professionals and work out the type of uh, AI solutions that are going to be meaningful and useful for you to embrace in your role. So really that's where it'll come. It'll come through the services, the software application services that you use and embrace. And that's why the change piece is so important because you need to be ensure that you're on the right platform uh, using the right technology and that will actually enable you to take advantage of AI solutions when they come out. Um, and there really are going to be a lot of uh, solutions coming out uh, in this decade. <clears throat> and this gives you a little bit of context as to why AI is, is really only becoming practical, accessible and useful now. I mean, you look back uh, 10 years ago, and if you look at the, the amount of... Um, uh, flops, as they call them, is effectively flop is the uh, the amount of multiplication, if you like, as com complex calculations that can be performed with computing power, and it's just become exponential in terms of uh, of where that's headed. So if you can if you combine that with the amount of data, which is a bit like the you need uh, data is like fuel for for an AI engine, and um, you need data, large amounts of data, uh, for AI to be in any way useful. And um, so uh, they're the two real kind of key principles. And cloud technology is, the, is that uh, ability that the internet uh, and, and cloud technology is, is ultimately what's giving uh, the access to uh, use AI solutions. So where do we see it in our everyday life? Uh, driverless cars is the, is the obvious one. Uh, I mean, Tesla do make cars, but probably Tesla's most valuable asset is the data that it's been building up from all the Tesla cars that have been driven all, all around the world. Um, so it, it's its ability to, pro to provide really, really safe driverless cars is really based on, on its uh, its technology. And Starlink, as you probably know, is, is going to be a network that will surround um, Earth uh, with ultimately providing Wi-Fi capability. So uh, 5G was a real breakthrough because it gave the ability to have very accurate measurements uh, so the cars kind of knew exactly where they are within centimeters, uh, and uh, and obviously the data uh, is 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 key to ensuring that driverless cars are safe and work. Customer service uh, chatbots um, in in accounts like you were actually we're our, our first AI is actually uh, going to be connected to our service, and we're building an AI um, support solution, ultimately to give people immediate answers to. Uh, key technical questions so that they don't actually have to wait for a, a response. Even though we have very, very fast response times, we'll be able to provide, you know, certainly we would estimate that half of our uh, tickets will be able to provide it with, with, with literally immediate answers. And then things that are slightly more difficult or technical uh, will require technical assistance. So customer service is a huge area for the use of AI. Uh, home automation, heating appliances, uh, example of Twitter removing hate comments, um, education. Um, there's some lovely learning paths um, in in education uh, tipped to come in. Um, I uh, was in conversation with somebody recently um, that has a 
developed a, a learning platform for mathematics. And um, ultimately what, what happens there is the child, when they're learning, will be asked and go down a learning path based on their the speed and accuracy at which they solve mathematical problems. And so every child will be taken on a, a, a learning path to suit their uh, their ability. And then the teacher is provided with all of that information the next day after their homework, which then allows them to direct direct their teaching attention to the students that need uh, you know different types of uh, of learning support. Uh, traffic, healthcare, IBM Watson, and, and obviously creativity is, is a big one too. Um, the reason it's so important to be on, on cloud technology, and this is kind of key to you know ultimately building out a strategy for your finance team, uh, by being uh, by being in, in the cloud uh, and making sure that your, your uh, different services that you use, so the different applications that you use should be on you know the best platforms um, out there. And um, Microsoft is the leading platform, uh, Azure. And uh, Azure have, you know, effectively got a, a shopping mall of, of, of tools that providers like um, your, your software providers will have access to, to effectively augment uh, into the application to provide you with various different robotic automation tools, integration tools, um, and uh, and AI tools. So you, you know your software uh, your software provider has got a range of, of technology at its fingertips um, basically by by being by partnering with the biggest uh, AI um, provider in the world, Microsoft. So it's kind of that's kind of a key part of strategy is making sure that you're you're with the providers that ultimately have uh, this new technology that will keep coming out the whole time. Um, so where is AI kind of emerging in fo for finance function uh, function? So accounting software in the cloud, that's a fundamental principle. So being on the cloud uh, allows you access current and future coming changes in tech. If you're on an older system, you probably know this, but a lot of older technology, it's never going to be able to access this type of technology because it's not in it's not in the cloud it's not it doesn't have the ability to access that technology and they're also tend to be end of life <clears throat> and therefore doesn't it's sort of, it's being maintained it's not being upgraded and um, apis are key so in terms of capturing data being able to process information with in accordance with different business rules uh, having uh, being on your your software provider having an API is, is really quite critical to having various different integrations, and um, so that that's key for automation um, and ensuring that the 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 sort of single source of truth, the key information, is moving from one system uh, to the other system, um, at the right time. Robotic process automation is another another sort of part of AI that's ultimately uh, the ability to uh, to have repeatable tasks. Um, bank recs are a good example uh, of that um, and then machine learning is where it's sort of it's taken to the next level which is it would be presenting you back <clears throat> with uh, what it thinks should happen next uh, uh, or also um, looking for patterns errors risks or scenario planning including storytelling and so we have a new reporting technology as an example uh, that is uh, got a lot of bi capability in it and they have a, an AI. It has a, an AI storytelling feature that they've launched in beta. And um, so again, all of these these things are new. Um, but again, they're all they're all based on on cloud technology. Um, so it does also allow. I mean, one of this is one of the key things. It's allowing your finance team to shift its focus away from uh, from from gathering the data um, uh, and processing it, and, and actually looking at the information. And having and being in conversation with your stakeholders, and so having much more time uh, to do that. Um, in terms of, of ways that it will bring significant changes to your accounting system, <clears throat> automation is a, is an obvious one. That's a, that's a key tenant for most people when they're looking at a new finance system or or any change. Is is how can we automate things and um, better, uh, faster, quicker, and more accurate. Uh, data analysis, identifying pattern trends, anomalies. Uh, so it, it's helping you to have more more accurate and informed decision making. Um, fraud detection is key. Financial forecasting using historical data, 
uh, and other relevant information to generate uh, more accurate, reliable forecasts, your compliance and regulatory reporting um, being automatically created and also uh, flagging for any discrepancies. And obviously cost reduction uh, is a key one. Um, we're obviously in a, we're, we're always in an inflationary environment, um, but your uh, non-profits are obviously really, really uh, a key tenant for any business or organization, but particularly non-profits as well is, is to ensure that they're, you know, that they're minimizing uh, their own cost, uh, but at the same time, um, ensuring that they've got really good information to make sure that they're sharing it in the right way with stakeholders, um, because that's obviously key. So data and communication really are the two, the two key tenants of, of a finance function and um, the ability to get the right information to the right person and communicate it uh, at the right time um, is, is really ultimately what the job of a finance team is. Um, and this reshaping the finance function of the future, the old finance function was, uh, you know, hugely um, resourced to, to uh, transact um, and, and process data, a huge amount of time spent in that space. Compliance and reporting is, is a critical fundamental element um, of, of a finance team, but that left very little time for uh, business decisions uh, in the space of doing new things um, and, uh, and like what is this information telling us? Uh, and this new finance function world of, of having uh, much more automation, so much less human time spent uh, processing, um, the compliance and reporting still being a critical um, element, but there will be lots of time saved there. And that gives this lovely large space for uh, you know, storytelling and sharing um, the right information with the right person at the right time. And really becoming a bedrock of changing the culture uh, of an organization to becoming uh, data-based in its decision-making. And, and finance teams are there to play a crucial role in that transition. So some tips for your team, um, before we get into talking to um, Janelle and, and actually looking at a real life case um, scenario of change, um, start to develop that data mindset. Um, you know, it, it, it does change uh, an organization away from <clears throat> away from to a certain extent from debate and politics uh, and much more uh, data centric to asking better questions and uh, being curious about about what does the data say uh, it, it's actually a much much more interesting way to uh, run an organization and it, it really generally makes people much more curious um, and it does really come from having this data mindset um, if you're uh, it, it will require upskilling. It, it also might require adding uh, new experience to the team. So that's existing team, saving time, having more time, upskilling, as well as maybe bringing in part-time or full-time new experience to the team um, are really around uh, around data, that data mindset. Um, so just think, think, think of it like a sandbox. Think about, about playing. Um, you know, it, it's really important that, that as an organization, in this decade and future decades develops a, a change mindset uh, this concept of an always on change mindset which is being proactive uh, to, to make small changes regularly uh, rather than kind of waiting uh, long periods of time where projects become then quite complex um, and and uh, risky um, if they're if they're sort of if they're too big uh, think demographic to um, experience uh, plus being open to bringing in uh, a mixed demographic of people into your team. Um, I would strongly recommend opening up a chat GPT, GPT account um, if you haven't already done so. And I'd be really surprised if you don't use it every day. Um, it's, it, the, the thing I find most useful about it is, is putting in like a reasonably uh, well-structured question uh, to help formulate a planning answer. So it's like it's a, if it's a strategy question, it'll actually produce you know, a planning uh, format for you. Um, it, it's really quite quite amazing. And, and then set a vision for your finance team. What's its purpose? What might it look like in three years? What obstacles are in the way? What new methods, processes, and technology um, will you use? And what data points will you be tracking, measuring, and sharing in conversations? So, so creating your dream, setting that vision. Again, what what is it? What is the purpose of your finance? Um, function and connected to the vision and purpose of your of your organization 
Um, what will you look like in three years? What are obstacles are in the way? It's a really, really good um, thing to be able to try to put down um, and what people, processes and tech will are needed to deliver this vision and purpose. And uh, a purpose is, uh, is a statement um, and a vision is probably several bullet points or several statements. So the purpose is, is really why, why you're there. Um, and in, in our customer success team, for example, we developed a purpose um, which was um, to, um, to provide uh, the right service to the right user at the right time using a combination of digital and human touch points. And then our vision is got uh, eight, eight bullet point statements, which is the future state of what we will look like um, and all of the work that we do uh, around our service in our business uh, is designed uh, to deliver the purpose and to execute upon our vision. And so it's a it's it's a really 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 powerful thing to do. Um, and it actually it sort of underpins quite a lot of the change decisions around you know what what people are engaged in, changes in your process, and then changing in and out and adding technology to help you deliver this vision and purpose. Um, and then what data will you be tracking, measuring, and sharing? So um, hopefully that's been a, a, a useful connection on AI. It's sort of a little bit around uh, how you might see the future of it coming into play um, for a finance team. Um, and then a little bit about um, how you might sort of put together and uh, with your team, a, a little bit of rethinking on your finances, uh, purpose and vision, and then putting a plan together uh, to understand what processes and technology might need to change for you to to ultimately be, I guess, as high performing a finance team as your resource base will allow, fit for purpose. Um, so at this point, we might do a little poll and um, just to ask you a few questions. Um, they are uh, it's confidential, um, so uh, but they're pretty benign questions, and um, so it'd be great if you could all. Have a little read of this and, and answer. So, what are the key barriers to undertaking a finance transformation project in your organization? So, what are the key barriers, okay, key obstacles, if you like, to undertaking a finance transformation project in your organization? Um, you'd prefer to keep going as long for as long as possible. So that's sort of effectively, you know, only change when you absolutely have to. Um, risk and complexity outweighs the benefits. So, does the risk or the or the fear or the or the perception of risk and complexity outweigh what you perceive the benefits are? Is it to do with the loss of historical data, uh, the cost and impact to the business, um, or personal and team fear of change? Just give a little bit more time for the poll to be answered. And then we'll move into conversation with Janelle and uh, get a sense of, of um, how the project was for you, Janelle, and uh, ultimately um, uh, the reasons for your change and how, how the whole experience has been. Okay, I think we can move off that now. Janelle, are you uh, mic ready? I am, yes. <laughs> Great. So, um, I mean, oh, there we go. Here's the answers. Um, super. So we'll just, okay, so interesting that no one wants to keep going for as long as possible. Um, I'm sure you can relate to some of these, uh, Janelle. I don't know, I don't know which... Which, which you would have ticked, um, but loss of historical data not really being a big one, a little bit of risk and complexity. So that, that could be, you know, not necessarily, we, we, we would like to think that it's actually not that difficult or complex to change, but there's obviously a perception of that. But the main one is cost and impact to the business, which is, which is pretty, pretty sizable. And I guess that's probably a, a, a key thing that we can uh, maybe unpick um, as part of a part of the your story, you know. So over to you. Yes, I think uh, we had those fears as well with our transition to a cloud-based system. Yeah. 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 So there's some details there. We were server-based for a lot of years since 2008, and um, 
and we've joined AIQ from summer of 2023. So we're currently near the end of our first financial year okay. on that system. And uh, 15, 15 years on, on Exchequer, ultimately, I guess, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Based on a server in the office that was accessed by the yeah. finance team. Yeah. Yeah. And um, well, was there a particular trigger, Janelle? Like, was there one particular catalyst, or was it a, a, a group, a, like a bunch of reasons, or anything that triggered it? We were considering cloud-based software and and actually assessing what was available prior okay. to lockdown, and uh, primarily because we'd replaced several servers, and obviously it wasn't um, future-proof. So we decided yeah. we needed to go to the cloud in the summer of. Um, 2019 and then um of course the pandemic in march 2020 made that much more urgent okay okay so probably the pandemic was probably a little bit of a a bit of a sort of we we need to definitely do this now was, as opposed to waiting real, any longer it was yeah. a real trigger yes yeah mm -hmm. okay mm. great um so, so there's some details going. of the work we do yeah. So you, so you obviously developing simplified financial reporting. You, you've got a lot of different stakeholders. Um, yes, we have. I think if, if we go to the next slide, there's, oh, some, yeah, okay, thanks, there's yeah. some details about SCA. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, great. There we are. Hmm. Photo of our, our chairman. Yes. It looks like Hawaiian Hawaiian. Uh, yes. Events. Yeah. It it was indeed. That is our chairman who was sadly passed. Last year. Oh yeah, that's yeah. uh. When did he last September? September, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sounded yeah. like a, a a phenomenal human. Um, obviously did a lot of a lot of work with multiple organisations. By the sounds of it. Yes, he he was a, a star, and uh, we are still recoiling from that, to be honest. Yeah. So there's some information about um SCBS. We've currently got fifty eight staff members. Okay. Which, when I consider back when we started with Exchequer, I think we had below 30. So we've, as an organization, we have really grown. Mm -hmm. We have 43 different projects running at the moment for which we need to do full accounts analysis for each of those projects. So mm -hmm. there's many stakeholders I've listed there. And, and an example of a project, I mean, we, we were talking before, I kind of found it interesting here. You, I think there was one project you mentioned about as practical as just moving, uh, moving furniture around. I think it was, or maybe you want to give a, a highlight of that just to show that sort of that that providing those crucial infill services yeah. that that. Um... Well, our core volunteering projects involve befriending. We have a, a project dealing with some um, dementia sufferers. Befriending. We also have youth development. Uh, Swansea Poverty Truth Commission, uh, Better Welcome Project for Asylum Seekers, uh, Social Prescribing, and several projects working around well-being for the community. So there's okay. a, a diverse range of projects, all of which have different um, sort of financial reporting requirements. And of course, the, the finance service is delivering, you know, reporting and data to all mm. of those different groups. And do you have different funders then, obviously, as a result of so many projects yes, yes. that you're obliged to report to? So a lot of stakeholder reporting. We do, yes, indeed. And, yeah. and various degrees of um, reporting, you know, in terms of obviously the detail that we need to report. Yeah. Okay. So it's quite a lot of demands from our, our finance system. Yeah, yeah. So I guess high level of your picture um, you might just go through that there, the situation you found. So I mean, you've touched on some of that that already with the, the first two points, I guess. Yes. So, um, so that was the trigger for us, um, for it being essential for us to be cloud-based. All of our teams now are hybrid working, so we're all remote workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we could, for a short period, access the account system on our server via a VPN, um, yeah. We needed to have a cloud-based system that we could all access whilst working remotely. And, okay. um, so AIQ is the service that we've decided to use. Okay. And um, 
uh, and has given us an awful lot of scope to um, develop our systems in order to use all of the facilities there. Okay, great. Mm. Um, I guess trying to sh shape or describe the problem, um, it's probably worth going through this as well because I'm sure a lot of people who are on the webinar will be able to relate to quite a number of, of their similar problem I points. I expect so, you know, it's <laughs> we're communicating, as you mentioned, communicating is a big part of the job, but it, it needs to be accurate and timely financial mm -hmm. information. And also, uh, importantly, presenting that information in a meaningful way to the stakeholders. As I say, we've got varying degrees of financial understanding, depending on who it is we're reporting to. And within SCDS, we're trying to progress engaging our budget holders with mm -hmm. financial reports that are meaningful for them. Okay. A, a different level of reporting. Yeah. And, um, and like most people, when you're, you're trying to manage a project to set up new systems, you're also ensuring sustainable financial security for the organization. And um, while still doing the day job, which is, is providing services at this time. And so we're trying to reduce waste, uh, which be that overheads, office overheads, but also our time that is spent on those administrative sort of processes, donkey work as such. Mm. And, Efficiency. And we, yes, we do have a very small team that's providing, delivering that service to uh, yeah. the eight employees, yeah. So being as efficient as possible is is really sort of crucial to to minding the value of the money that's being provided to the funders, obviously to make sure that it, it, the maximum amount of funding you know goes to goes to the right the right home, right? Yes, well, the organization is trying to deliver as much service as possible with the funds yeah. available. And yeah. so obviously you know we want to um, have as little waste as possible. Yeah. Uh, within um, the core services of the organization. Yeah. I'm sure that's a, a key a key uh, tenant or objective of, of all nonprofits. And then the solution. So the solution was some um, is is still it's still ongoing, developing flexible reporting tools for the broad spectrum of stakeholders that we're reporting to. Um, First and foremost is reporting to our trustees who are responsible for SCBS uh, so that they're comfortable making decisions. But um, well, you saw the list of uh, funders, so the people providing finance each have specific requirements within their projects that we have to report back on, spend and budget. So we need really efficient budgeting and spend monitoring systems within the organisations so that... Um, we can make quick uh, quick responses and quick actions on those projects. Mm -hmm. So in, in the background to that, we need to simplify and automate as many data entry tasks as possible. So we're not spending too much time on the, the data entry and um, engaging and training non-finance colleagues, be they within the organization or uh, people we're reporting to. And, of course, responding to their feedback so that we're evolving and improving the service, uh, depending on how it's been received. Okay. And the ability to, I guess, I guess the ability to collaborate digitally as much as possible uh, by, I guess, capturing information from different systems and sources, you know, processing that information and then sharing it out or getting some feedback the more you can do on a platform obviously it makes it hugely more accurate timely and efficient yeah it does indeed yeah yeah and have you got a a reasonable use of the of the the dimensions in accounts IQ, like the the bi dimensions is that probably a fundamental part for fund and project management i guess probably isn't it? yes it is yeah. for our cost centers but um yeah we're also we're on a learning curve, and yeah. I do want to develop that further. It's obviously got so much potential for us to yeah. analyze the data, and yeah. uh, and for it to link through so that there's a, a nice clear audit trail. And yeah. um, it, yes, it's just having the time to train up and develop that. Yeah, that's that kind of a piece about sort of always on change. You're you're uh, you can get on to. You know, you can change onto a new platform or application for lots of different things, but uh, it's making sure that you've got the uh, 
the vision and the uh, objective to continue to embrace uh, little extra changes and con- so it's a it's it's really a continuous process to some extent, isn't it? It is indeed, and, and quite a lot of learning as well. Okay, yeah, no doubt you you uh, turned over many stones as part of the change project. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, and it, yeah, it, and your future vision. Yes, first and foremost, a happy and productive finance team. Sounds um, beautiful. It does doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, dream. That's my dream. Yeah, and um, easily managed financial reporting systems. I think which we we've just touched on slick data collection methods that um can be done quickly and and automated as much as possible. Yeah, and um improving the understanding of finance within SCBS with non finance staff and engagement of the budget holders within SCBS, and uh and then. Once we've sort of achieved achieved a certain level, hopefully there there'll be potential to share that financial knowledge across the sector. Fantastic. To improve the situation for our member charities, yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. It's quite I, I can picture and visualise that. It's a really nice uh, vision, actually. Um, and naturally, then you can create a series of. Uh, people resource requirements and uh, various different small and large projects that will ultimately implement that vision i think the sector is is providing delivering so many services now uh, across communities definitely in wales and um so it does need you know to be uh more business like in its approach yeah. yeah and then there's always you know, good things. Good things usually have obstacles before you uh, manage to get them done. Um, you've you've kind of noted some obstacles here. Yes. Do you want I to, uh, do you want to share? That... Like the obviously the cost one is 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 you know there's, how did you how did you find that in the end? I mean, like what when you say cost is obviously you know there's money to be paid for for technology, but like is there is there other implications for what, what you deem as cost? Yes, primarily the the cost for the technology, also costs in a sense of time. Time is money, and yeah. Uh, yeah. how how resource heavy it was for the transition, but okay. then offsetting that with how resource heavy the the use of the system will be, you know, moving forward. So uh, I think you've always got that trade off, haven't you? Yeah. Um, a reliance on cloud systems, IT systems, being as we are all being based now in the cloud yeah and uh and alongside that data security i think we all have that concern that yeah. um, all the work we're doing is is safe and secure yeah and uh and the final point there resistance from co-workers i think and how did you find how did you find that um that has been very good for us within scds but yeah. i think that that hinges on sort of the level of training and uh how familiar people are with various IT systems using them, uh, and also as you said uh, in your questionnaire, resist. You know, people just don't want to change. Keep the old system yeah. as long as possible. Yeah, it's funny. You know, often the people, often the, the we find uh, the people who resist are can be resistant initially when they do get across the the knowledge curve and the learning curve, and they actually are often the biggest advocates then because. Uh, you know, I guess it's just making sure that you socialize the vision and uh, maybe share the share the uh, share the project ownership. I guess with people, that's kind of that's kind of part of it. I think, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yeah. Um. That kind of that kind of puts us in a a nice position for a bit of Q and A. Um. You know, thank you very much for. And uh, we'll 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 sort of co-answer questions here now that come in. But thank you very much for taking the time to share your experience of a change journey. And um, I'm sure it's resonated with nearly I'm sure everybody on the on the webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, Great. Yeah. Thank you both so much. That was really interesting. As a COO of a charity myself, I found that really interesting. So we have had some questions come through. Uh, so I will, without further ado, get straight to it. 
So Fiona has asked, can you advise where to go for training on AI tools that do and will support financial forecasting and automation? Uh, great question. Um, I'd be really happy to uh, to take a like a, a personal connection on that one, by the way, just as a as a starting point. And um, so I'm very happy that my email is shared with whoever asked that question. Um, I just I've I've the, the the stuff on AI before. Just so you know, I I learned it from you know from uh, going on courses. I did a certificate in AI, uh, and I've been on a couple of practical webinars. There, it, I can I can give you the name of somebody who who runs webinars. I would say one of the best things to do is to just get a little bit of learning about AI. I think it's just it, it'll really help your decision making and expectations around around AI. And then uh, there is there's lots of different products uh, like Microsoft being the leaders in AI. That would be a, a first uh, stop for anyone. Um, like Power BI is a really important, uh, really good forecasting tool, but it, it's really only as good as how you set it up and, and the information that you put into it. And um, we've got a new technology um, coming out. It's called uh, Click, where it's a, our embed reporting and analytics tool. Um, like you can buy Click uh, online. It's it's like a Tableau. So you know Tableau, Power BI, and Click are our Gartner's top quadrant uh, reporting and forecasting tools. The forecasting side of things, I do think that's going to be determined and dependent upon the uh, where, like the, the, the vendor or the software you're using, because that's actually where your historical information will reside. So uh, like that, that's going to be quite key to that. And so I, I haven't given you like maybe the perfect go over here and buy this and, and there's your answer but hopefully there's enough in that to um to have a conversation with me certainly uh, and make further understand exactly what a practical solution might look like great thank you great. dan that's really helpful okay. uh we've had what size is the finance team at scvs and has it changed size since the implementation if you're happy to share so i'll pass over to you janelle there Currently, there are four of us, and uh, it's increased by one since we switched over to cloud-based system. Interesting. And do you think you'll? Do you think just to add into that question? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether the person asking was wondering, uh, like, are we going to get a cost saving, or are we going to be able to provide more employment? <laughs> it obviously depends. But do you? Uh, do do you foresee that there's sort of like the, the so you've got more cost okay but are, is there more value that you're that you're seeing and will see off the back of 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 what your team is going to be able to do? Uh definitely. I think yeah. I mean, the fact that we've increased the uh, size of the team that that need was what has been there for several years. So. Um, okay. Okay. It's only recently that we've got the extra person. So it's kind of almost the project maybe allowed you to create to create the budget need. Indeed, it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. I will carry on. So, uh, what sort of reporting is built into Accounts IQ? Okay. Um, I'll take that. Uh, so we have there's several different ways to report in a in accounts IQ. We, the the main reporting library uh, basically runs on Microsoft reporting services. So that's effectively uh, very very detailed pre built uh, queries um, that are accessible through a library of different reports. So nothing you probably haven't seen before. You've got you know your AR, your AP, your taxation, um, your uh, sales. Uh, reporting your profit and loss balance sheets, cash flow forecasting, reporting all of those things, uh, including consolidated reporting if that's uh, multi entity required. So it's a full library of over 250 reports that are parameter based. I know, Janelle, you use the, the OData connector, um, which is effectively a live API connection. So that allows you to build your own. Uh, reporting, uh, uh, automated reporting live to, to your system. Um, I think you find that pretty useful now and, and see a future 
use case for that, Janelle, don't you? I think that that becomes so bespoke then within um, Excel spreadsheets and using pivot tables and, and what have you that uh, anybody could use that and, yeah. and get precisely the data that they need. Yeah, um, we we accounts of queue also, as I mentioned, have a click, um, which is uh, embedded dashboards that's coming out this year. Um, and there will also be an editor license, which will allow you to effectively build your own reports in the system, um, which is going to be pretty slick. Um, and there is all sorts of future capability in that click embedded reporting. Uh, I mentioned uh, storytelling as a new beta product that click has. Um, so there'll be... Uh, so effectively, there's your library reports, there's your OData connector, which is do what you want in Excel. And then there's the new click embedded um, BI and dash custom reporting. So, so quite a number of, of, of ways. And then there's just your classic transaction browser, um, which is you know kind of a way within the product to effectively find whatever information you're looking to find by doing simple queries against the actual database tables themselves. So quite a lot of different ways to access what you need. Great. Um, and then one, I think yeah. we have time for maybe one more, which is a shame because we have a couple left. But um, I'm I'm sure, Darren, you can follow up with these people individually. Okay. These people yeah, great. Love to. So one was, I think this is a really good question, actually. Why is reliance on cloud IT systems an obstacle? Do you find that's a problem because this person was expecting that to be pretty trouble free? Can you just repeat that a bit? Yeah. Oh, you yeah. take that, Janelle. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so I think the that. obstacle section, yeah. Why is reliance on cloud IT systems? Why would that be an obstacle? I suppose it's not an obstacle per se, but it, it's a risk that that we are aware of, that um that we are relying on these other third party products for for all of our data records and history mm. uh, and also all of our day-to-day -day operations. So um yeah aware of that risk yeah it's important i guess just to give you uh some questions to maybe consider around around uh, cloud providers um we are i we are iso accredited so there's sort of a like a standard level of uh which requires a certain amount of resource focused on security uh things like <clears throat> two-factor authentication uh like it is is really really important uh, the ability to profile user access those things are really important. Uh, you know, things like failover and um, backup and failover capabilities. Um, you know, it, being on something like Azure, like naturally comes with an enormous amount of, of best in, in world uh, uh, data security. So I think there's lots of really easy questions. Uh, happy to to uh, go through them uh, offline if someone wants to contact me to make sure that you're able to ask the right questions of your different cloud providers because it is really important and it it could get overlooked, Janelle. By you know, you're, you it's in your mind, but um, you know, it 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 could be an obstacle um, if uh, if. I guess if, if you're if someone on the board is asking questions and you're not able to give them the right answers. Great. Thank you both. So I think that's all we've got time for today, which is such a shame. But like I said, Darren can follow up and Janelle, you can follow up with people as there were a couple of questions left. Uh, so thank you so much for such an engaging and informative webinar. As I mentioned at the start, the session's been recorded and will be uploaded to watch on demand within a week's time. The slides and other resources will be made available by the end of today. So don't worry if you've missed anything. And if you do feel comfortable sharing any feedback with us, uh, we've pasted the link in the chat. So please do feel free to fill that in. It will only take a couple of minutes and it just really helps us to keep improve, you know, keep on improving our services. Um, we have uh, some workshops coming up that will be uh, helping with fundraising, marketing, AI and leadership. So the charity digital workshop in person in March. So we've pasted the link for that. Uh, and we've also got a webinar on the 29th of February on digital mapping tools. Uh, all of our webinars are free. So yeah, do feel free to sign up and keep an eye on when those are coming. Um, and thank you so much for joining today. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thanks for hosting us, Alice. No worries. Yeah, it's been great.